about something which will be mostly seem very trivial, putting bootstrap values in a pre or a network. But we'll see there's actually quite some, some tricky things which can happen, which um, may be surprising. And just last week, I got an email from a friend, kind of Vigo Malo, which I worked together in Vigo, and he kind of possible important back in Fungon. First, I must say I prefer the term feature instead of bug. <laughs> and so, what is the problem? Nowadays, most of the analysis is done of many individuals from very closely related species or even from the populations, so it's kind of mixing and we can produce lots of data and if we just look at relatively short genes, it can happen that several individuals actually have exactly the same sequences or they have sequences where we maybe have an ambiguous state and another sequence, so the distance between these two sequences when we actually compute them seems to be zero. So what we actually get is a case where we have terraces of trees which Derek Zwickel in the first session was talking about kind of a very special case because we just duplicate sequences. But if we then look at bootstrap values for different trees, we actually will see they are really high, even we kind of have, um, have really a lot of different possible trees. So let's assume, I always kind of seem to work in labs where all the other people are going sampling on some nice islands. <laughs> so we have here a tiny small little island and people look at different populations of your, their favorite species whatever this may be, and if they are on islands, you can normally qualify them for different beaches. I thought they're either sampling at surf beaches, at snorkeling beaches, or at sandy beaches, and some of them, these, now I kind of sample kind of individuals which are kind of always three times exactly the same. But if we, so on the left, kind of three, the three on the left, Oops. Sorry. Oh. Here kind of shows really the the, the perfect the, the time kind of it's just simulated, but here these three sequences are totally identical. But if you look at the bootstrap values, they actually are 97% or 100%, and that seems to be a, a kind of a contradiction to to the data we generated actually. So the problem is actually very, very old and in maximum parsimony it was very common that you can have multiple optima and one of the solutions is just to randomize the input text up. And so in my software just kind of included this if I'm bootstrapping now data and kind of sampling the columns with replacement and I'm sampling the um, sequences without replacement. So I think Felsenstein called this jumbo. And this is kind of really nice, it works very well. The only disadvantage is you need really each time you do a bootstrap sample start with a different tree from scratch because otherwise it may not really change all these um, uh, randomize all these sequences nicely. But as we kind of see in kind of just a simulation, now we have kind of different trees, and if we make 100 bootstrap samples, the values are kind of close here to, yeah, between 24 and 45, but uh, they are kind of similar to a third, and if we make 1,000 bootstrap samples, they are kind of pretty much in a third what we would expect for kind of random association of these. So we really have kind of here terraces of actually 27 different possible trees. So that's kind of very nice and it's kind of helped kind of make Diego happy for this analysis, but we actually can do slightly um, better or we can have two different solutions. And the first one is we actually can 
try to filter duplicate sequences because we kind of can just look first for sequences and see can we find duplicated sequences. And that's in a sense pretty simple to do. And then we can build our tree on the duck on only the unique sequences and this has also the advantage if you use maximum likelihood or some other methods, it's most of the time much faster to compute a tree with less sequences. And sometimes you see that there's actually half of the sequences duplicated if you look just at a gene tree. And so it kind of has really been a nice thing that it's, it's faster. And then in the end, we can we know what's the dif distance between our duplicated sequences and these sequences that are duplicated from is because it's zero. So we kind of can just can add them as a multiplication, if you like, in our tree. And so this kind of is a nice. Um, I, I kind of like this method mostly just because to speed it up my algorithm. So that's kind of need and the, um, the only problem is ambiguous sequences kind of always cause a little bit of problems because if you have an, um, oh, yeah, if one sequence is kind of coded as N, so it could be any state and another one is an A, you kind of have to take the kind of consensus of them, so it would be kind of an A or a for the consensus sequence. So you may have kind of a consensus sequence which is non, not represented in any of your original sequences. And you have, can have distance between zero, between one sequence and um, a positive value to some other sequences. So then there really must be each of each other's zero. But that's kind of kind of a thing still needs to be implemented, but that's not a big problem. The other way is there's a third solution, and that's kind of if we have already made our bootstrap um, sample, we can actually do almost the same trick because we kind of know that many of the if you look at these edge lengths of each of the bootstrap samples, we see many of them are zero. And that's kind of, um, we just can collapse these internal edges which are zero, we get multiplications, and if we then fill the bootstrap tree from the, these multiplicating trees, these, the, yeah, these edges which had 100% bootstrap before, they are just missing, so they have zero percent support. The only restriction is here that really the edge rate, the, the, the trees and bootstrap samples needs to have weights. Because sometimes you make the bootstrap samples and you want to save memory, so you delete the, the edge lengths. And so the, the tree from this solution two and three would be just a multiplicating tree, which would be kind of also represent our nine, the tree we had perfectly. But um, you still have to, this is kind of still a little bit trick, not the original tree, because here these edge lengths here, I'm showing these multiplications, but these edge lengths are actually zero, so they don't mean anything. And that kind of is a little bit uh, kind of a side effect, which is maybe not really in the literature much used, but how do we actually parameterize our gene trees then? Because we can count the edges, how many edges, how many parameters do we need to estimate? If we have a bifurcating tree, we have kind of this edge which lead, leads to our plate. So we have one, two, three, four, five different parameters. If we use solution two and three, we kind of can reduce them, in our case here, to four, but if we have five or six taxa, it actually reduces the number of parameters or the number of edges we estimate for considerably, and we could even think of, we could also use something like 
in haplotype networks where we actually uh, label different um, of our individuals to adjust the node, which would then just give one edge. So, and the thing is, all these trees we kind of estimated beforehand, they all have this, it, exactly the same likelihood. It doesn't even, they have different number of parameters we kind of estimate, but we estimate of a natural length zero, they have exactly the same likelihood. But the AIC and the BIC, or the ESIC, which is another, well, it's the BIC, would exactly, um, would differ considerably, and uh, Chuk's Pento and uh, GTA plus Gamma plus I plus um, G model or, um, would have only a difference of, of 10 um, in degrees of freedom, but if we have 100 duplicated taxa, the number of degrees of freedom would um, change 100 between these different approaches, which is kind of quite considerably. We normally take in model tests just the differences between the AIC or BIC values, and so they are safe if you just use it for, for one gene. But the AICC actually, how it's defined, is actually could change the order of the different models depending on if you introduce multiplications or not, which is a little bit scary. And the next thing which makes pro programs like Refrain that, that are probably more challenging is actually the number of um, additional parameters can, can change. Um, you actually add parameters if you can patternate trees because you can resolve edges. So that was the one. Um, comment. The other one is I just kind of implemented also in Pangolin a method to add support values to a network so it can use the format from splits tree and you can take a bunch of trees and add the support of our neighbor net, for example, onto it. So which is some colleagues always did by hand. So that's kind of looks pretty much identical than like a um, split tree output. So that I have to, yeah, that is kind of really just what I said beforehand. I think the effect size for these bootstrap values is really important. If we have a match length of zero, a hundred percent bootstrap value doesn't make any any sense in my opinion. And I think there needs to be better methods to optimize or estimate the numbers of parameters in a phylogenetic tree. So and that's almost everything, but there's so these are all the people I need to acknowledge, Liam Ravel and Quinn and Christine in my lab for providing me this data and money and this Alistair and David and Guido we worked on this network stuff. And there's one more thing. And we'll organize an phylogenic developer boot camp in August in Nantucket Island. And so that some spot and maybe the island in the beginning I used that's Nantucket. And it was April and Liam remotely. And yeah, if you have questions, just meet me later or somewhere during the conference. And here are the contact details. Thanks.